Welcome. This is uh, inverses of cubic functions for Algebra 2. And um, today's lesson, if you missed class or if you're just trying to get caught up, is um, how can you find the function that is the inverse of a cubic function? Now, a cubic function, again, is like this. Um, we've done that in the last semester. So as you plug in, we choose really nice numbers like negative 2. Negative 2 times negative 2 is positive 4 times negative 2 is negative 8. Uh, negative 1 times negative 1 is negative 1 times negative, or I mean is positive 1, times negative 1 is negative 1. 0 times 0 times 0 is 0. 1 times 1 times 1 is 1. And 2 times 2 times 2 is 8. So that's how we get our x and y. When we graph them, it looks like the S shape. That is the parent cubic function. Now, because x cubed is a 1 to 1 function, Remember, that means that none of the x's are cheating and none of the y's are cheating. It also means that as we cut it across the uh, inverse line, y equals x line, it will also be a function going that way. Because it's a one-to-one -one function, it means that the inverse, the cube root, is also a function. And here we have the cube root function. Okay, and again, we choose those nice numbers. Negative 8, the cube root of negative 8, when you break it down. Remember from algebra 1, you can go like this. Break down the negative 8 into prime, so it would be negative 2 times negative 2 times negative 2. And because it's in a cube root, remember in algebra 1, we talked about that like a prison that it takes three to get one out. So we have to mark out all three to get just one out. That's how we get the cube root of negative eight is negative two. And then when you graph that, you come clear over to negative eight down to negative two. And it graphs as the S shape that's inverted from that, okay? Explain how the values of the tables in X cubed and cube root of X show that the graphs of these functions are reflections of each other across the y equals x line. Well, if they are reflections of each other across the y equals x line, we call them inverses. And if they are inverses from our square root 5-2 lesson, if you haven't had it yet, you should go there first, we found that the inverses, the input and the output were reversed so that the output from the one becomes the input of the next. So they're reversed. That's, you should have that in your own words on that page. Okay. Now, right here it says, is g of x cube root of x also a one-to-one -one function? And you could look at the points and verify that it's a one-to-one -one function, that the x and the y don't cheat. Or you can use the graph and the vertical line test to verify that it's a function. Okay? You would have to cite one of those reasonings when you explain it. What are the domain and range of the, of the x cubed? What are the domain and the range of the cube root? Well, looking at your graphs again, the cube, the domain, that means are there any limitations? Does the graph stop and have a turning point out here? on the x where it won't go any further? The answer is no, it just keeps going out wider and wider as it goes up and down. Same thing on the y, as it goes out, it goes down, as it goes out, it goes up. So there's no limitations on the y. It's all real numbers for the x cubed. We also see it's all real numbers for the cube root because it goes forever and ever to the right and the left and it also continues to go down and continues to go up. Okay, so that would be the answer on there is all real numbers and that you need to explain why and how it works that way. Now on this, we're graphing the inverse function uh, um, of 0.5x cubed. So we do it like we did with the graphing of inverse functions in the past. We go ahead and we graph the regular function first. So we would plug in negative 2 to the cube function. 
So negative 2 times negative 2 is positive 4 times negative 2 is negative 8. Half of negative 8 is negative 4. Negative 1 times negative 1 is 1 times negative 1 is negative 1. Half of negative 1 is 0 0.5. 0 times 0 times 0 is 0 times 0 0.5 is 0. So go ahead and fill in the last two there. And then you would graph this and it should be that S shape coming up. Just put your points in here. Once you have your points in there, list them down here. Once you list them down here to go to the inverse function, you just take your output and your input and switch them around. So your X and Y become your X and Y this way. They're switched. That one goes here, that one goes there. For every single point you do that. And then you go back up and you graph these points showing the inverse function. Now the one thing that you should do when you graph those is you should also put in your y equals x line. That's y equals x. And then be able to show by perpendicular lines that the original function is an exact inverse of the inverse function or vice versa how you'd say it. Okay, next thing you do is you take the rule that you were given up here and we want to find the inverse by the rule so we replace f of x with y and then I just go ahead and swap my input output so there's they're swapped now divide by 0.5 on each side uh, remember that um, any number it can be x or whatever divided by a half you skip flip and multiply so you flip that 2 up to the top, so that's equal to 2x over 1, which you can just write as 2x. Then on your next step, you would take the cube root to get rid of the cube on that y, because the cube root will cancel the cube, and then you'll just get y. What you do on one side, you do on the other, so that becomes cube root. So we have cube root of 2x equals y. That's your inverse function to this function. Okay. What is the inverse function of a x cubed? Well, if you look back, we went from 1 half x cubed to 2x under the cube root. So a x cubed would become 1 over a x cube root. If you can remember this little rule here, that we just flip that a value under 1 or over 1, on the inverses, then that will really help you and you know that a cube is the inverse of a cube root or vice versa. Okay, now this is talking about vertical shrink and um, and how it affects here. So if we just take an example, let's say we have 4x cubed, that is a vertical stretch. But now if we invert it, our inverse would be cube root of 1 fourth x. Well, this was a vertical stretch. That meant the graph got pulled away from the x. And when we invert it, we simply reflect it over this horizontal line. If it's pulled away from this axis and it's inverted, then can you see how it would still be pulled away from now this axis? So we call that a horizontal stretch. I know that it doesn't look like it would be a stretch, but it is. You've got to think of the inverse that it came from. So now the one thing that I do ask is that you say what the factor is, so it's a, a vertical stra stretch by 4, and this would be a horizontal stretch by 4, even though it looks like 1 fourth in there. Now I bet you could get this one. If I said this is 1 fourth x cubed, what would the inverse be? What is this here? What number would go right there? Look at the pattern here and think about what this pattern might become. This, as you know from previous units, 
is a vertical shrink or compression by one fourth. So I need you, once you find that number, to indicate what kind of horizontal action would be taken and by what factor. Okay? So down here, the value for A, if it is greater than 1, and it's in this location, it is a vertical stretch by the factor of that A. Now when you invert it, that becomes the 1 over A in front of the X, or you can just put X over A either way, and that is still a horizontal stretch. And I wouldn't put by 4 because you didn't use the 4 in here. It would just be by A. Okay. Now, if your A value is between 0 and 1, meaning it's a fraction, then we have a vertical compression or vertical shrink by whatever that 1 over A value is. If it's horizontal in here, you have the X over a 1 over A. Remember, you skip, flip, and multiply, that will become an AX under the square root. This was originally under square root. They're equal. Now that's going to be a horizontal shrink by that A value. Here's a real world problem that will help with this. We have a pike, a freshwater fish, and this fisherman has developed a function WL equals L cubed over 3,500. He's just found that this number as a, um, as a non-variable number, just a solid number, if you take the length and you cube it, and then you divide by that 3,500, you can estimate the weight in pounds. He's just gathered that information from doing a lot of this. So they want us to write the inverse function. So we can move it to 1 over 3500 L cubed, which means that the A value is 1 over 3500 in the L cubed position. So to invert it, you would bring it up on top, so it would be 3500. Now one thing that I want to mention here is if you have LW, just like how you have F of X, and X is your input, you'll come over here and you'll have an equation with X in it, that's telling you what the input is over here. So when you see LW, just like f of x, you had an x, LW means because the input's right there, it's going to be a w in here. See how this one was WL, and the input is L. So, in case you've never noticed that before, that happens. Okay, last page of the class notes. Complete the table of values and use it to graph the function LW round the values of L to the nearest whole number. Okay, so what they're saying is you take these points and you plug them in back here in this equation. Okay, I would suggest that you do that with your calculator. You can, if you're at home, you could use your phone and get the calculator on it. So you will go um, 3500 times zero and then raise it to the one-third. In a calculator, if you don't have a cube root, you can go 3,500 times, or parenthesis, um, 1 equals, push enter, and then take that and raise it to the 1 divided by 3, and then hit enter, and it will give you your answer. In case you're on a calculator that can't do um, cube roots. You could do that possibly. Fill in all of these values and then you're going to go ahead and graph this. Then they want you to use the function and plug in 7 for a 7 pound pike. Okay, so this is the weight 7. 7 times 3500 is 24,500. Now you take the cube root of that and you'll have your estimated length. With the estimated length, it is about so many inches long. So you're taking weights, you're plugging them in, and you're coming out with a graph that will show you an estimated length in inches. 
How could you check that you found the inverse of W of L correctly? Well, there's a couple different ways. You could graph the L of W and see if it's an inverse across that Y equals X line. You could look at your points and plug them into the other equation and see if they end up being input-output switch. Um, gosh, there's probably about three other ways you could do. Those would be the most popular, I think. What is the significance of the context of the problem? At approximately 6, 28. If we come up to the graph, 6 and up to 28 means that you've got a 6 pound, always include your axis when you're going with the context of a problem, you have a 6 pound fish that is about 28 inches long. That would be the context. What are the reasonable domain and range of the function? Well, domain, let's think about this. If you're looking at weight, what are some numbers that you couldn't have for weight? Can you have um, a fish that's less than a zero? Can you even have a fish that's zero pounds? Not if he's a fish. He's got to have some weight. So reasonable domain would be all positives, above zero. Reasonable range, that's your length. Again, think about whether or not you could have a fish that's under a certain amount. Is there a limitation there? I certainly should see some sentences there explaining that. Describe another way you could use, you could estimate the length of a seven pound pike. Well, the way that we used here was we plugged it in. You could always come over to this graph line that you would have and go to seven and go up and estimate what your answer should be. I would always suggest if you have a graph, you do the math and then go to the graph and make sure that your answer is a reasonable amount. And always think it through too. So that is, uh, five three. How can you find the function that is the inverse of the cubic function? And hopefully you feel like you know how to do that now. Okay. The other thing that we want to look at is the homework. In the homework, you're asked to do four graphing problems here. Actually five, because this one's like a word problem. Okay. Graph the function f of x, then graph its inverse, f negative one, and write the rule for it. So we had 2x cubed, so 2x cubed brought us this line right here. It's the S shape going up like that, and it's stretched. So I would put f of x, and I got those points by plugging in my values. 0 cubed is 0 times 2 is 0. 1 cubed is 1 times 2 is 2, that's how I get 1, 2. Negative 1 cubed is negative 1 times 2 is negative 2. So it gets this line right here. Now, if I do my yx line, then I can match this point to that. That point stays there. This point to that point. And I have my f of negative 1, my inverse function. Okay? Now, in order to get the cube root 1 half x, I think back to my a value. a is over 1 there, so it's going to be under 1 here. And it's the cube root is the inverse. Okay, not too um, tricky. Go back to the, to the notes. Remember, math is always patterns and relationships, and it should make sense. If it does not make sense, then you need to go back and study it more. Even Google search it. You don't have to be studying my videos. You can study others. So now we have the function volume, a function of radius, is 4 thirds pi times the radius cubed. Okay. This gives the volume in cubic inches of a sphere with a radius of r inches. Okay. So we say write and graph the inverse function of rv. So now we want the input to be v. So RV, that means the input is V. And I would flip the A value to 3 fourths. The pi was up here being multiplied, so it would go on the bottom to be divided, and then put it under the cube root. To the nearest inch, what is the radius of a basketball with a volume 455 cubic inches? 
I would expect you to be able to plug that in, plug the volume in, and put it through a calculator and get an answer here. And then over here, you will have made points for this graph. And the way that I would do that is I would plug in 100 and calculate to get the answer and then plot the point. Plug in 200 into V. 200 times 3 divided by 4 times pi, enter and then take the cube root or raise it to the one third. And just go through all these and plot your points. On the back side, um, again these are pretty self-explanatory. The top one I help students with in class um, because they are wanting you to find the capacity. Capacity would include the measurement of 7.48 gallons times your volume. Volume is length times width times height and they tell you that your uh, length is three times the width, height is twice the width. So we get 3w times w times 2w equals 6w times 7.48 and so that should be written, included in this C of W. C of W. would equal 6 times 7.48 times 6w. And I would go ahead and get that worked out, what that number is. And then you can just plug in your w's. Write and graph the inverse function. So now you're going to switch it around. Think of that as an a value. And then to the nearest foot, what is the width of the tank? So they're going to have you calculate it and also look it up on the graph. Now when you graph this one again, I would take the um, capacity, which you'll do it on the inverse graph, take the capacity of these amounts and plug them into your inverse equation to get your points. Down here, you need to multiply this out and you'll end up with an x cubed and then some other factors here, but it's asking, is this a cubic function? When you multiply, you can box or foil, and then you multiply by this x. You'll end up with x cubed as your leading um, amount, or your leading um, term. And so that tells you it is a cubic function. You can also look here and see that it crosses the zero at three points. That's a cubic function. Uh, is this f of x a one-to-one -one function? I already wrote no in there for you, because if you tip this, you can prove to me that it's not going to have one-to-one. -one. Or if you look at the chart for it, the, the input-output table. Does an inverse function uh, for f of x exist? No. Explain why. Okay, explain why it can't be an inverse function. Function is the key word here. Give one way to restrict the domain so that the inverse function exists. Okay, think back to your quadratic if you need to. You need to restrict that domain so that you don't have any numbers repeating on the x or the y. Okay, down here you are going to give me the inverse function. Inverse function, again think of your a value and switch it. Um, and then tell me what kind of stretch or shrink it is. Okay. Uh, wait a second. Describe the graph of each function as a transformation of the graph of the... Oh, I'm sorry. You don't have to give the inverse function. All you need to do is tell me what kind of stretch or shrink these are. Okay? They are different. One of them is a vertical stretch uh, or shrink, and one of them is a horizontal stretch or shrink. And it's super important you know what the position of that is. So go back and study it in your notes. Uh, feel free to pause and rewind and all that. We'll see you in class tomorrow.